Well, good morning. It's time to get started with our class this morning. If you would be opening your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Jay Don, would you lead our prayer for us this morning? Most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, for our thanks for this time and opportunity to begin this forgiveness together, together, and study that affords our Lord. We pray, Lord, that we study with open minds and open hearts. Much and lasting good will be accomplished. We thank you for Josh as he presents a lesson. That Luke chapter 17 is a continuation of the conversation that Jesus is having with both his disciples as well as with the Pharisees, as we saw begin in chapter 16. But we see as we begin chapter 17 that he's shifting his focus just a little bit, and rather than addressing the Pharisees specifically, we see that he is now addressing his disciples specifically. But remember that the Pharisees are still in the audience. They're still hearing the things that Jesus is saying. And so as we begin with verse 1, it says that he said unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. So while we see that he is directly uh, speaking to the disciples, indirectly we see that he is making reference here to some other people that are in the crowd. Because the Pharisees were some of the very ones that were placing these offenses, or um, a better word that we could use would be temptations. And so Jesus says, he says, it's inevitable. Temptations are going to come. There's never going to be a time in life where we can sit back and say, well, I'm not going to be tempted. He said, as the King James says, it's impossible or it is inevitable. This is something that is going to happen. But he takes this a step further. So starting out is a warning to the disciples. Be on guard. Be prepared. Temptations are going to come. But then we see a slight shift, or at least this is the way that I see this, because this next statement that he makes in this verse, I feel that this is more directed to the Jewish leaders who are in the audience. Because he then goes on to say, but woe unto him through whom they come. Woe unto him that brings temptation. Well, as we've seen in the last few chapters here in the book of Luke, Jesus has been dealing with many of the issues that the Pharisees were causing. They were placing restrictions upon uh, upon the Jewish people that were never intended to be a part of the law of Moses. They were trying to hold back their faith in Jesus because they didn't want to lose their power. They didn't want to accept the fact that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so they were placing uh, these hardships and these trials in front of the people. But we see Jesus has already acknowledged the fact that while they were putting these things 
out there that they were holding the people accountable for these things that they weren't willing to live by it themselves. They weren't willing to practice what they were preaching. And so the statement is made, and he's going to elaborate on it a little bit more when we get into verse 2. He says, woe or, or danger or beware. If you put a temptation in front of someone, it's not a good thing. And so this is something that we can certainly still apply to ourselves today. We need to be careful that in our dealings, in our words, in the things, in the interactions that we have with people, that we are not placing some type of a temptation before them. Now certainly we know that each person is tempted in different ways. There are certain things that may tempt you that are not a strong temptation to me and vice versa. But there are certain things that we as children of God just automatically understand that we don't need to do. We automatically understand that this is not something that that we need to be posing to another person. We don't need to be causing a temptation to come. Well, and there's ways that we can still teach and, and guide. We can teach by example and, and things of that nature. It doesn't have to be just an in-your-face, you're in sin, you've got to change. You know, there, we, everything we have to do or everything we do has to be done with their soul in mind, and we do that because we have a love for their soul. But, it's, but what this is saying is we have to be very cautious in the way that we handle things because, you know, it's very easy to discourage someone. It's very easy to drive someone away. It's very easy to, uh, to put that temptation in front of someone. But also we need to be very cautious in our actions because if we... You know, we sit here in the church building and we act like we're doing the right thing, but then we get out here in the community and we act in a different way. People see us doing things that are sinful in nature. Then that's going to put a temptation in front of them as well because they're going to see us as being hypocritical. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, let's come on down into verse 2. And let's see this, this next point that Jesus makes. He says, it were better for him. This is talking about the one that tempts another. He says, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Simply put... Jesus says it would be better off for that person to lose their physical life than to cause someone to lose their eternal salvation. And he takes this concept of this heavy millstone, it being uh, chained to a person's neck, then being cast into the sea, something that undoubtedly would bring about that person's physical death but it's not going to have any detriment to that person's soul. But on the other hand, if we put a temptation in front of someone and it causes them to leave their faith, it causes them to lose their soul, who's going to have to answer for that on the Day of Judgment? We are. Now, of course, they still have the, the final decision. You know, they're the ones that can still decide. Are we going to succumb to this temptation or are we going to overcome it? 
but we're still going to have to answer for why we tempted that person. And so we have to be very cautious in our dealings. But then let's look at verse 3, and I want us to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think there's been some misconceptions that uh, people have understood in regard to the subject of repentance and forgiveness. Verse 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Folks, I've heard people say many times that we are to forgive a person whether they repent or not. But I cannot find anywhere in the Bible where it says that this is something that we are able to do. Now, we should have the heart of forgiveness. We should have the desire to forgive but can we really forgive someone if they do not repent? They've broken the trust. Well, that is true. But also, we look at this from the standpoint of our relationship with God. Is God going to forgive us if we do not repent? No. Now, does God desire to forgive us? Does God have the heart of forgiveness? Is he ready to forgive at a moment's notice? Yes. Now, with that being said, that does not mean that if that person has not repented, that we can be mean to that person, that we can avoid that person, that we can have uh, hateful feelings toward that person. No. I'm not saying that at all. But what the Scriptures teach numerous times is that if that person repents, then we forgive that person. He's talking about brother, brother in Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So take, for instance, and I always use Elton for an example. I'll use him again. Say Elton does something that, that is sinful against me. He hurts me in some way but he never does come to me and repent. He never does come to me and ask me to forgive him of what he did wrong. According to the scriptures, can I forgive him in that situation? I don't think we can. But we can still have the desire to forgive. We can have the heart of forgiveness because everything that we see in the scriptures says if they repent, then we forgive. And going on down into the next verse, it says, And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent. There's that again. This concept of repentance. Folks, something that we have to understand. Forgiveness cannot take place without repentance. Is God going to forgive our sins if we do not repent? If we come forward and say that we want to be baptized into Christ, but we have not first repented of our sins, is that baptism going to take our sins away? No. But I think this is something that we oftentimes don't look at to the extent that we need to. Repentance is a turning away. Meaning that we have a desire in our heart to turn away from that sin. And so using the example that I gave, if Elton does something against me and he comes to me and he asks me to forgive him, then it's my duty as his Christian brother to forgive him. And as Jesus says in the very next verse, even if he does it over and over and over, and he comes to me each time and asks for my forgiveness, 
then it's my duty to forgive him. Yes, sir. But, uh, and if, if he uh, repents, then forgive him. To me, this, these are outward acts, how we react to them. Uh, uh, don't, don't condone sin in their life. That's right. And uh, it is, it's in the context of not uh, causing an offense to them to cause them to stumble. If you condone sinful action, then really you're you're tempting them to continue. That's right. You, you, you know, you go on with that. So this is more, we can't see the heart, but uh, this is our a- outward reaction to, uh, to something maybe, you know, that they've done. That's right. I think that's a very good point. Very good way of looking at it. But let me say this as well. There may be times that we never have an opportunity to forgive someone. At least from the sense, like Carrie was talking about, outwardly. Going back to Elton, if Elton sins against me, in my heart, at least the way that I feel toward him because of my love for his soul, my desire in my heart is that I'm not going to hold that against him. But outwardly, like Carrie said, I can't do anything to make him feel that what he did wrong is okay. And so if he comes to me, and as Carrie said, if I go to him, because it may be that he doesn't know what he's done wrong. It may be that he doesn't know that he has offended me in some way which Elton and I are close enough that if he's done something to offend me, I'm going to tell him. But that's what we're supposed to do. If you do something against me, I'm supposed to go to you. Or if I do something that offends you, that you feel is a sin against you, I want you to come tell me. Because we cannot make it right. We cannot do so in a scriptural fashion if we do not have that interaction with each other. Because as the scriptures say, we cannot, as this says, if if I do not rebuke, and so often this concept of rebuke has a, a negative connotation to it, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we can come to someone and we can talk to them about something that they've done wrong that has hurt us in such a way that they do not feel that we are attacking them. Rebuke simply means that we go to them and we let them know what they did wrong. That way they have an opportunity, number one, to know what they did wrong. Number two, to know that you know what they did wrong and to know that they need to repent. And then if they repent, we let them know. We forgive you. And then also by our actions, we show that we forgive them. We don't continue to hold any type of of, of feelings toward them in a negative sense whatsoever. In fact, I would take it so far as to say that we shouldn't have feelings of negativity toward them anyway. Because our desire should be that they would repent. We should have a heart of love toward them. Not condoning what they did wrong, but going back to as we saw here in the first verse, but also not handling that in such a way that it's going to make matters worse. That it could drive them further away. Because, or go right ahead. Says I repent. Uh, it, it tells you we can't read the heart, and 
we're That's not right. to judge whether he's truly repented or not. But if he says that was wrong, I shouldn't have done it, you know, type thing, then then we we're forgiven. That's right. And I and what you said I think is so important. So many times I feel like we try to judge the heart. We try to judge the intent. We can't do that. We can't read the heart. All we can do is go off of what we see outwardly. And I know several times I've seen people that have come forward, that have expressed a desire to be baptized, And then I've had people come up to me afterwards and say, well, I really don't think that person was sincere. Well, that's not really our place to judge, is it? Now, we judge based upon their fruits, do we not? If they are displaying fruits that are a display that they have repented of their sins, then yes, we know that they were honest, that they were sincere, But I don't read anywhere in the scriptures, folks, where it says that we are to be a detective agency. That we are to go around trying to investigate every single aspect of a person's life. But I know that there are congregations, I know there are some here in northeast Arkansas, that if you come to that congregation and you want to be a member of that congregation, they give you a questionnaire that you have to fill out. And they want to know all about your background. They want to know all about your doctrinal stances. They want to know all these details about you before they will welcome you into the fellowship of that congregation. I don't think that's appropriate. (coughs) I don't think so. That's true. That is true. When we become children of God, and so often we fail to realize that in Matthew's account of the Great Commission, it says, go and teach and baptize, and then teach to observe all things. When someone becomes a child of God, they're not going to have the same knowledge that a person has who's been a Christian for even five years. But then we look at those of us, maybe those that grew up in the church, who understand a lot of the ways that the church functions, a lot of the terminology that we use. And I mean, you know, frankly, there are some things that we say and do that outsiders aren't really going to understand from the outset. Do you think it's appropriate for the ownership or somebody's coming in like a new family and trying to have a relationship? I think, in my opinion... John, I think each of those situations would have to be handled uh, situationally. Um, well, you know, it's one of those situations that if a per- that if someone comes in and they are trying to hide something in their past from everyone else. Who's really at fault in that? I mean, it's not the congregation at fault. It's not the leaders at fault. It's that person at fault. And, you know, I know of, of situations that in congregations that I've been a part of where there were situations like that where people did have things in their past that were not right and they were presently in situations that were not right. But when they came into that congregation, they kept all that hid. And, you know, over time, as information came to the surface and things of that nature, the leaders dealt with that as those situations arose. And, and generally, that's kind of the way that I've always felt that it should be. You know, we don't need to be... What's the word I'm trying to think of? We don't... We don't need to doubt people. And we don't need to be so overbearing on people that they feel like, well, they're not welcoming. They they don't they don't want us to be a part of them. It it is. (laughs) 
Well, and John, that would be a situation then where I feel the elder should address that. Yes, it, it's an issue where that should be addressed in that situation. But if we have a new family, say say this morning we have a new family come in, say, hey, we've just moved to Pocahontas, and we would we would love to be a part of the congregation. I don't think it's David and Tom's place to pull them aside and say, well, tell us about all your background. Tell us about everything. I, I, I don't personally think that it is the role of the elders to be a detective and investigate everything about their life, but if things do come to the surface, then those are things that need to be addressed in that way. At least that's my uh, feelings on the matter. Now, I'm not going to, if, if the elders of a congregation feel that that's what they need to do, then certainly they're at liberty to do that. But by my estimation, I don't think it needs to be to the extent that that some go to. It does. It does. And as I said, every situation is different. If it's, if it's a family that comes in here and we know the family, we know, uh, we know about them and things of that nature, then generally we welcome them into our fellowship. There's not a lot of uh, proving of themselves that they have to do because they're known. But if it's someone that's new that comes in, you know, I've seen congregations that, you know, you have a new businessman come to town and he's popular in the community. He comes to the church and immediately they put him in a leadership position because they want to be seen as popular. You know, we've got so-and-so that comes to church here. He's one of our leaders. Well, we really don't know that person. They need to prove themselves. Do what now? Well, that, that's true. And so often, and, and I'll say this from the outset, folks, I'm not an elder. I'm not qualified to be an elder. One of these days, hopefully I will be. There are people in this auditorium this morning who have served as elders in the past. And you might be able to... Um, express your feelings on this better than I can, but at the position in life and understanding that I am at this point, I think that's a decision that the eldership should make situationally. I don't think it's something that a, a blanket policy should be made, but it's a situational thing. If, if, um, if a couple comes in or a family comes in and we don't know them, you know, it might be a good thing for uh, a couple of the elders and their wives to take them out to eat or just sit down with them and just visit with them, get to know them a little bit. But don't make them feel like they're being attacked. Just get to know them, have a relationship with them. And so there's, there's certain ways that these things can be handled. It doesn't have to be, well, we're going to pull you into a meeting and we're going to grill you under the lights before we'll allow you to be a part of this congregation. I don't think it's supposed to be that way. But certainly, do I... I agree with this, I just throw this out, but when an eldership, say, decides to let an individual come in, they have to have a To me, it's just common sense. You would want to know what that person believes, and at least basically, you know, basic sure. doctrine before you allow them to get out of Absolutely, and and that is part of the responsibilities of an elder. Uh, so often, I think many elderships have the mentality that they are to do the work of a deacon. But the role of an elder is the spiritual overseer of a congregation. And as Carrie said, it is the elder's role to oversee what is being taught, the kind of influence that's being had, things of that nature. 
And so, you know, there's several ways that that could be done. You know, I mean, you don't want to put someone in that type of role that has just come to the congregation that you don't know about that person. Uh, so, yes, I mean, there needs to be a time of proving. But also, you know, in my opinion, I think it's always a good thing for an elder to be in that Bible class. And like, for instance, I mean, on Sunday mornings here at Pyburn Street, both of our elders teach classes. I think that's a wonderful thing. You know, one of the qualifications of elders is apt to teach. David and Tom are both accomplished teachers. But, as I said, we have men in this auditorium this morning that have served as elders in the past. And so I know that if I get up here and I misspeak or I say something that's not exactly correct, I know that there are men here, and not just the ones that have served as elders, but I know that there are men here that are sound in the scriptures that will call me out on that, and I appreciate that. And so steps have been taken to make sure that the things that are being taught, I mean, as well, we record all of our lessons here at Pyburn Street. And so if there's ever any question, if you ever think that I have said something that is wrong, tell me and I'll go back and listen to it. And most of you have been here long enough to know that there have been a few times that I've had to get up and say, you know, maybe I wasn't as clear as I needed to be, or I didn't say this exactly the way I wanted to say it. I'm, I, I don't care to do that. But that's why it's important that we have those checks and balances there. We have people that are willing to, you know, make sure that the truth is being taught. But coming back to what we see, and we are out of time, but the whole point that Jesus is making here is that if someone sins against you, there is a twofold responsibility. There's a responsibility on your part and a responsibility on the part of the one that sinned. You're to go to that person. You're to confront them. Do that in a loving way. Not a confrontational, in-your-face way. But go to them and let them know what they've done. If that person repents, then you are bound by your Christian duty to forgive that person. And you are to do that as often as you are required to. As often as that occurs, you're bound to do that. So we're going to stop there for this morning. Lord willing, next Sunday morning we'll pick up in verse 5.